Well, welcome to our fifth teaching moment. And in this teaching moment, we are going to be building those timelines of the end times, or that study of eschatology is that, that academic scholarly word for it. But these timelines of the end times. And remember that when we're doing this, so far we've seen premillennialism, but each one of these different interpretive lenses are going to take us in completely different directions. And in today's teaching moment, we're going to be focusing on this direction right here called postmillennialism. So let's figure out what that word postmillennialism means and what it's implying by going back to this little chart right here and saying, okay, written text, check. Storyline, check. Background, check. We've done that. We're right here. Remember, interpretive lens. What lens should we use? Last week, when we looked at the lenses that we were going to use, we chose futurist. Well, for this week, when we're talking about postmillennialism, our interpretive lens is going to be preterism. Ooh, okay. Just a little quick review. Preterist perspective, when they're reading this book, they're seeing that Revelation predicted the historical fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Essentially, the book of Revelation happened sometime in the past. There might be a few different events that get disputed. Was it the fall of Jerusalem? Was it the fall of the Roman Empire? Eh. Well, it happened in the past sometime. They're reading these events as already happened. Key, right? So if we take our preterist perspective, our preterist lens, and we start to look at our familiar storyline, same storyline we'll see each of the different uh, viewpoints in the timeline and times, using our storyline here, we're familiar with it. Remember, this is that period of tribulation where the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bulls. And then let's build a timeline from our storyline. Well, this millennium, right? That's our landmark in the sand that kind of helps us determine where are we in relationship to the timeline. And if we think about a preterist perspective and remember the lens, we have to focus on the lens. The lens is saying that these events have happened in the past. The tribulation has happened in the past. So where would we be on this timeline? Well, we would be somewhere over here, right? We would be over here. A pre-millennial perspective would say we're, we're over here, right? This is in the future. But this, preterist, it's in the past. So we're over here because these events have already happened in history. We can go to the history books and look at them. That was, that was the fall of Jerusalem, right? This is in the past. So we're over here. So if we were to make a fancy name, a fancy word to describe where we're at in relationship to our landmark, well, that would be called post-millennialism. In reference to our landmark, if we're over here, pre-millennialism. So post-millennialism. This is describing where we are currently in the timeline. And as we think about where we're at in the timeline, you'll notice that what is ahead in store for us? Well, the new creation. Good stuff. That's next up on the docket, right? That's the good things we get to look forward to. It, it's not, we're not looking forward to the tribulation. That has happened in the past. That's, that's, that's history, literally, right? What we're looking forward to is the new creation. That's the next event that is, we are anticipating. So as we think about the implications of this preterist timeline, we might ask that familiar question that we asked of the um, of that futurist perspective that led us to premillennialism. Remember the, the key question that was so significant in the last teaching moment was this question, when will the rapture happen? Key idea, when will the rapture happen? And you know what? That's not really an important question for the postmillennial perspective. Because think about the implications of that question. Why was that question so significant? Well, that question was important because it determined what we were anticipating. Are, are we anticipating like left behind style where we're going to be spared from the tribulation? Are we going to go through part of this tribulation or all this tribulation? Like, do I need to go out and start buying food? Like, what, what do I need to do? 
This has a massive implication when the rapture is going to happen because they're the events that I'm immediately anticipating. But going to the post-millennial perspective, the rapture, it happened in the past. It's already done. Why are you worrying about if the church is going to be going through the tribulation or not? That, that's not the most important question. The most important question is, what's currently happening as we're anticipating this new creation? How are we seeing this new creation being ushered in? And so for a post-millennial, they're not really going to put a lot of emphasis on pre-trib, post-trib, um, uh, mid-trib. They might have a model. They might say, eh, I'm pre-trib, but it's not really going to come up in conversation with a post-millennial because it's really not that significant of a question for them. So that's a key difference between pre-millennial and post-millennial. Most of the time, if someone comes up to you in a conversation and they say, oh, you know what? I'm a pre-trib. I'm a post-trib. I'm a mid-trib. You can almost assume that they're going to be pre-millennial. You can ask them and ch double check, but that's not really an identifier that a post-millennial person would even really use. It's not really, th they'd say, I'm, I'm over here, right? Let, let's talk about the new creation. That's the important question to me, right? That, that's their perspective as they're approaching this book. And so as we hear those buzzwords get tossed around, um, those buzzwords of pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib are not really going to be significant for post-millennial or as we'll see next, all-millennial. Those are really words that are significant for that, that idea that this is in the future, right? We're anticipating. Is the church going to go through it or not? That's an important question for a premillennial. Okay. Important note, important implication for this timeline because it helps us to, to recognize what is happening. We're anticipating new creation. Now, we had this chart. I described it before. Premillennial, the world's getting worse. Postmillennial, they're saying it's getting better, right? But let's figure out why. Well, remember this timeline that we're looking at? It's getting better because this millennium's over here. We're right here, and we're anticipating this new creation. So we're, we're looking out on the world with this postmillennial perspective and saying the world is day by day getting better. How would they explain that? How would they see that? Well, um, this perspective was especially prevalent around the 1800s, 1900s, essentially before World War I. Because what was happening in the world that helped shape this lens that they're looking and, and put emphasis on this lens is they're looking around and they're seeing this country called the United States and it's, it's starting to promote democracy and there's freedoms that are starting to emerge and there are all these blessings that are happening where there, there's advances where, oh man, now, now there's antibiotics and, and sicknesses and treatments and vaccines and technologies that are making life easier day by day you know, like it used to be I had to go out there and plow the field by hand. And then all of a sudden, look at this. I got tractors and automobiles. Technology is increasing. Life is getting easier. Oh, we've got electricity. Like the world is becoming a better place. Look at all these incredible improvements in the world, right? You can almost feel why someone would be led to put some emphasis on, a, on that, that, that post-millennial perspective and why it would be so prevalent in the world, especially before World War I. Now, there was a big change in the world when it came to World War I and World War, world war II because all these beautiful technologies that were making life easier, and they're saying, look at the world's getting better. This is great. We are ushering in the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth. This is, this is Christ building his kingdom here on earth. It's happening. Well, until they realized those beautiful gifts of technology also made machine guns and tanks and atomic bombs. And they saw all this technology start to twist on them where those things that were kind of ushering in these, this beauty and this increase in this quality of life and the new creation, all of a sudden the perspective of the world shifted with World War I and World War II where they saw these same technology instruments that were so good all of, a, all of a sudden become incredibly destructive and the world start going to war, right? And, and, and death that has 
on a scale like of weapons, like atomic bombs, that there's, there is death and destruction on a scale we've never even seen before. Whoa, that is not better, right? So we have been impacted, impacted as modern readers in the 21st century by some of those events through history that we've seen. And the lens that maybe someone 100, 200 years ago would be impacted by, would, would, this would be a pretty common perspective. This would be something that, that was very prevalent. So if you go back in history and you start to read works from various commentators from these time periods before World War I, this is something that you might notice. If you read a commentary from, from, of Revelation from you know, 1889, well, they might have a post-millennial perspective on the world. And that's the way they might be reading it and placing us right there. Not as common in, in our modern time because of events like World War I and World War, World War II. But good to keep in mind, this is a perspective that circulates. It's in scholarship. Sometimes you read it and might hear quotes from it. So good to be familiar with it and how they came to it. Remember, preterist viewpoint of revelation. Now, so far, what have we done? We have done premillennialism. We have done postmillennialism, right? And, and we're starting to see way different, like future, past, whoa, completely different timelines and implications of those timelines and significance of those timelines. The questions are different. Now the next one is amillennialism. And this one is one that many people struggle with. This is a perspective that, that sometimes can be difficult to wrap our heads around. But don't worry, we're gonna do a little work Hopefully by the end of this next teaching moment ahead of us, you will be confident to be able to explain each of these three different ones. You can look at a chart and kind of understand where they're coming from. So a little sneak preview for you, a sneak peek, because I want you to kind of start thinking about how in the world would an amillennialist even approach this book? Well, remember this key question, what lens should we use? Well, for an amillennialist, they're going to choose the idealist perspective, the idealist approach, which says Revelation portrays the universal and timeless battle between good and evil. And if we were to take that lens and apply it onto the book of Revelation, that's how we're going to get to our amillennial time frame, our amillennial perspective. And so, just let our minds start to like fizzle and let it kind of wrap around, right? Pre-millennial, they're seeing it in the future. Post-millennial, they're seeing these events as happening in the past. Ah, millennial, it's timeless. It's happening over and over and over. These events in Revelation are not a point in history. They are the pattern of history, right? Sneak peek, I wanted, to, I wanted to just plant that idea, a little stone in your shoe, to get you thinking about it, and then come back for the next teaching moment, and we'll talk through it and figure out exactly what's happening with this. All right, enjoy reading the book of Revelation this week.